say it again. <laughs> I always uh, forget about that voice that says this meeting is being recorded. So let me start over. Welcome to our weekly Zoom news conference. I'm Sandy Close, Director of the Ethnic Media Services. And today we take on a question so many of us are asking ourselves. Should we or should we not get a booster, also known as the third shot? Public health experts are divided about who should get the third shot and when. Currently, only those who took the Pfizer vaccine for their first two shots are eligible for a third shot. Boosters are not yet available for people who got the two-dose Moderna vaccine or the single-shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Two medical experts who've appeared on our briefings a number of times will offer their views and are ready to take our questions. We welcome Dr. Ben Newman, Chief Virologist at the Global Health Research Complex at Texas A&M University. Thank you for being a repeat offender coming back. And Dr. Monica Gandhi, Professor of Medicine at UCF San Francisco's School of Medicine, who had the lead op-ed in today's Wall Street Journal. We will email bios of each speaker and the Zoom video after the conference. Please enter your questions on the chat box and we will ask our speakers to answer them either during the conference via chat or if we have time uh, in person. And to our speakers, remember to speak slowly so our wonderful interpreters can keep up with you in Spanish, Mandarin, and Korean. And a special thanks to our interpreters. We have two speakers instead of what we've been having recently on a number of calls, many voices, very, very taxing for the interpreters. Now I will turn the microphone over to contributing editor, Sunita Sarabji, co coordinator of these conference calls. Thank you, Sunita. Thank you, Sandy, and welcome, Dr. Newman. And uh, uh, Dr. Gandhi should be coming on soon. We hope there's a situation at UCSF which may preempt her from joining us today. But uh, welcome, Dr. Newman. Um, we'd like you to start with offering your opinion on whether we should all be getting the boosters or who should be getting the boosters. All right. Thank you very much. It is nice when there are other speakers because I don't feel that the entire weight of the scientific community is on my back, but I will do my best. <laughs> so I will start by responding uh, to Dr. Gandhi's op-ed piece today. And I think that is a good preface for the conversation on boosters in general. So, First, I would say that the important thing to remember is that we do not know what is and is not possible. And you will frequently hear people say that SARS coronavirus 2 is endemic, it is impossible to eradicate it, it is impossible to exterminate it. I don't believe either of these things is actually settled yet. Um, all right, so I think we should very much focus on exterminating SARS coronavirus 2, and here are the reasons. SARS coronavirus 2 will probably always kill a percentage of the people that it infects. Looking at the numbers from around the world, in the early phase, when testing is erratic, you see quite a bit of variety. But the case fatality rate, which is the number of people who die versus the number of people who are confirmed infected, always seems to settle down to about 2%. And we know there are differences with age, but 
one out of 50 people who get COVID-19 are most likely to die. And I say this based on all the data we have now. There really isn't any counter data suggesting that the virus will change to suit us. I would also say that uh, SARS coronavirus 2 will so, likely- Sorry, Dr. Newman, those... sorry to interrupt. Did you say 15 or 50? I just want to make sure that uh, the interpreters get it correctly. One um, out of every- 50. Oh, one out of every five, five zero. Five zero. Pardon. Yes, I wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm. Yeah, yeah, not 15, that would be even worse. <laughs> thank goodness. A percentage of people who are vaccinated and get breakthrough COVID will also be hospitalized or die from COVID. And as far as we can tell, this will continue indefinitely. There is no data to suggest otherwise. If you were to tell me that we are releasing a wild animal in my neighborhood, something like a rhinoceros, I don't know that it would kill 2% of the people in that neighborhood. <laughs> I think probably less, but I would still be opposed to it. <laughs> and I do not think it is necessarily the best policy moving forward. So let's see. Okay, the data for boosters that I will be sharing comes from the FDA meeting of the 17th of September. And I put a link, if you scroll all the way up in the chat, um, to two of the documents that I think contain most of the information uh, that's useful. Uh, and if that does not show up there, please let me know so I can repost it. Uh, all right. That data suggests that we are using the term fully vaccinated incorrectly no one is fully vaccinated. And in fact, we do not really know at this stage what fully vaccinated would look like. What we have evidence for is waning immunity. And there are different degrees. And I think this is where people differ. In general, there seem to be two schools of thought. One that I would call the extreme consequentialist school where if a person does not die, then the outcome is essentially less meaningful. And the other that I would say is the maybe chess player or trying to look one step ahead mentality. And I would very much side with looking one step ahead. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, as vaccines, no, as time passes after vaccination, we see that the amount of protection decreases to around 50% after five months in the data that's presented. But the amount of protection against death remains constant at somewhere around 90%. And this is the dichotomy that is catching people because SARS coronavirus 2 is fundamentally a moving target. It is evolving and it is changing. And if we look at the path of change, the virus has got faster and better at reproducing very consistently throughout the outbreak. And based on the available data, we do not have any evidence to suggest that this will be otherwise in the future. There are many variants now, but over 99% of the variants that are infecting people currently, as of September, are Delta. And there are now over 40 subtypes of Delta out there that are being monitored. So Delta is essentially synonymous with SARS-CoV-2 now in the real world. But the good news is that the effectiveness of the vaccines against Delta is about the same as the effectiveness against any of the other variants. The difference is slight at most 5%, although it does decrease at about the same rate as protection decreases against any other variant. So what we have seen 
in the FDA documents are that there's a relatively small difference between people who are over 65 and people who are under 65 in terms of how effective the vaccines are. And the difference is between five and 10% effectiveness difference. We have also seen that the benefit of a booster is very large regardless of age group. With a booster, people end up with between five times and 10 times as much antibody as they had at the peak after the second vaccine. And they end up with as much as 50, five zero, times as much vaccine, as much antibody as they had uh, right before the booster. So the benefits appear to be universal. The consequences appear to be relatively similar uh, across age groups. And so on that basis, it is hard for me as a virologist to understand the FDA's decision to recommend boosters only for a certain age group and not for everyone. Uh, based purely on the data, it would look as though, um, yeah, universal vaccination, universal boosters are uh, going to be beneficial. As for the concept of a booster itself, there are very few vaccines of all the ones that we take where we only take two doses. Uh, the three that I could find are the hepatitis A, the MMR vaccine, and I wrote the third one down somewhere. Wow, I don't remember where it is. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> All the other vaccines, we take generally three or more doses of these. And we do this because we are trying to move toward a position where vaccine immunity is durable, durable enough that you don't have to pay extra attention, durable enough that it will last for years or a lifetime. So with additional vaccine doses, we are essentially trying to move from what is considered reasonable protection to a position of certainty. And I think the benefit there is very, very large psychologically and just in terms of hope and in terms of the possibility for a better life without COVID-19. So all I would, well, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's a uh, good place to stop. And if there are any questions, we can we can go further in whatever direction is useful. There are, of course, a number of questions. Um, and the first one will come from Fatme Bakit. Uh, Fatme, welcome. Are you able to unmute? Yeah. There you go. So uh, may I ask your question for you, Fatma? So um, uh, Dr. Newman, just to go back to a little bit of the basics, uh, Fatma asked, what is a booster? Is it different from the first you know, couple of shots that we took? And um, you know, how does this uh, differ in, in concept if it does? Yeah, it is not different. It is identical to the other shots. Uh, at least the Pfizer booster is and the other boosters presumably will be as well. This is okay because we know that vaccinating against the original strain still produces roughly equal levels of protection against all the variants that are out there. And I suppose most of those are actually irrelevant compared to Delta, but it produces the same amount of immunity against Delta. So, yeah. Okay. Khalil uh, has a question for you. He asks, is the subtype the same as the variant? These are different terms for what might be the same thing. It would depend who is using the term and what they're trying to get across. But I think that those could be equivalent. Okay. Uh, Henrietta Burroughs has an interesting question. Henrietta. 
Thanks, Sunita. Uh, Dr. Newman, is the uh, virus any different than other viruses and how it's mutating and spreading? For example, it's been said the Delta 19 virus is it's more infectious, it's um, uh, it spread far more easily, more faster. So can we treat this virus like we have other viruses like smallpox or polio? And we expect it to eventually be eliminated with all of the boosters or is it somehow intrinsically different? So I think that is not known, but I would argue that we should. And the goal should very much be to push the vaccines and see how hard we can squeeze COVID-19, regardless of the variant. I like that you mentioned polio and smallpox, which are two viruses that we have, in the one case, virtually eliminated, and the other case, eliminated completely through widespread vaccination. And I think in that sense, yes, we can. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 mutates at about the same rate, actually slightly less than uh, polio virus, and at a much greater rate than, uh, uh, pardon me, it mutates slightly more than polio virus, and at a much greater rate than uh, the smallpox virus. So there is the potential that there is a somewhat greater challenge, but with both of those viruses, polio and smallpox had thousands of years to circulate in the human population and diversify before we started vaccinating. And sars coronavirus 2 is still a little less than two years from its point of origin in humans, which means that this will eventually be a problem that will be much more difficult to solve than it is now, which is why I would argue very strongly for a appropriately strong, I'm using the same word again, response while we still have time. Thank you. Terrific. The next question comes from Pilar Marrero. Pilar. Ah. Okay, I wasn't, I wasn't able to unmute until now. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Newman, big fan of yours here. Um, <laughs> so, you know, your position seems to be similar to that of Dr. Fauci, who has said that he would favor universal boosting to, for everyone. Um, he disagreed with that, you know, with the CDC, the FDA, Dr. Walensky, everyone, by the way, all those people, all those institutions seem to have a different position on boosters. So it seems to me that the messaging has not been great coming from the government and it's confusing people. So um, I don't know if you're the one to respond to this, but why is this happening? <laughs> <sighs> That's a good question. I think I am able to, or I choose to take a very narrow position defined only by the scientific data. And I think when you widen the scope of your concerns and bring in other factors, then it can lead to conclusions that you would not draw necessarily from looking at the data. And I would speculate that that is what is happening here. Based on the raw data, yeah, I would say that uh, universal boosting and possibly three or four uh, doses look as though they would be very beneficial in slowing the spread of the virus and in bringing about the end of the virus faster. I think the social justice issue is real in that every extra dose in the US is potentially one fewer dose in another part of the world. But I would go back and say that I don't think anyone is fully vaccinated right now. And at some point, we need to get somewhere fully vaccinated. And so if not here, then where? And if not now, then when? The logistics are in place to make it at least possible here, whereas it may not be possible or as facile other, way, other places. 
Dr. Newman, uh, there are a number of questions for you in the chat, but I would like to ask a question based on what you just said. Um, you uh, quad last week we pled we pledged 1.2 billion doses to developing countries around the world. We've delivered 79 million doses as of now. Are those 1.2 billion doses sufficient to address this crisis globally? And will people in you know countries that are at much higher risk than ours uh, be able to get the necessary boosters? At the moment, it's still a matter of getting the necessary first and second doses, I think, in most parts of the world. Right. And COVID isn't over until it is over everywhere. Yeah, as we've said before. So I, in my mind, I would say, fight this the way you fight a fire. Put it out completely in one place and then widen the ring of protection until it covers everyone. The question I think the US government would have is whose responsibility is this and who should pay for it? I, I like though that uh, the government are attempting to address what is otherwise going to be a shortfall and what is going to be a weak link in um, our efforts to vaccinate. If we do not stop this everywhere, it will eventually come back in some form. So Dr. Gandhi is here. I know we have a number of questions in the chat, but um, let's hear from Dr. Gandhi before we move on to those um, remaining questions in the chat. Dr. Gandhi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I know you've got uh, a situation going on at UCSF and I, we very much appreciate that you are here nonetheless. Oh, thank you for having me. And that was a great talk. Um, I, if it's okay with you, I'd like to share a few slides. Is that okay? Absolutely. While I absolutely okay, yes. great. So I'll just talk. This is just to actually talk a little bit about the immune system, which I think is helpful when we have this discussion. And um, I actually first want to talk about the concept of endemicity and the concept of what makes a virus. What are the features of a virus that makes it eradicable versus sort of um, being able to be controlled? And if we think about the features that make a virus uh, or a infection eradicable, like take Dr. Gandhi, slow down just a little bit for Ooh, our interpreters. Sorry. sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, so to be eradicated, to actually be you know, have no presence on the planet, essentially, except in a, in, in a test tube. Um, there are four distinctive features of a virus uh, that allow that to happen. No animal reservoir, um, very clear features so that there's only this infection can be this infection. So this is an example of smallpox, um, only rinderpest, uh, which is a cattle uh, disease and smallpox have ever been eradicated. And here you can see that there's nothing else this could be but smallpox, a very short period of infectiousness and then immunity for life and, uh, and then a highly effective vaccine. And all those conditions were met for smallpox and allowed it to leave the earth. Um, it's in a couple of test tubes, but um, but the features of SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, measles, pertussis, these are all infections that, that um, let's stick with COVID-19, has animal hosts. Um, its infection looks like a lot of other infections, a respiratory infection. It can be spread even before you're sick, um, so it doesn't have a short period of infectiousness. And what we're talking about today, we don't know if you're immune for life, um, but uh, we do have a highly effective vaccine. But likely what will happen with COVID is it will go the way of measles, it will go the way of pertussis, where it'll always be with us. It's called endemic because it's not causing undue disease. Um, but how do we get an infection to get to endemicity, to get to endemic? So that's kind of a uh, start for when I go into the immune system. So, you know, we have three vaccines in this country, um, Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson as authorized, but there are a number of vaccines across the world, six more um, that involve the spike protein, uh, sorry, three more that involve the spike protein. 
of the virus, which like the three that we have in this country, and then three that are inactivated whole uh, virus candidates, including one in India uh, called Covaxin, and several from China, Sinovac and Sinopharm, where they, the virus is inactivated. And the ones that involve the spike protein, like Johnson Johnson, Moderna, Pfizer, what we have in this country, that spike protein is what attaches the virus to the host cell. And they either in some way code for the spike protein, or there is one candidate that actually gives you the spike protein, that's called Novavax. And um, the others in some way give you genetic material that allows you to code for the spike protein and then you raise an immune response against that spike protein and then that genetic material goes away. And so does the spike protein. And so those, um, you know, again, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca are the two, what are called DNA um, va um, vaccines that they're surrounded by a, uh, an adenovirus, but they, and so does Sputnik V, but they, um, they all essentially give you the DNA when then you make into the mRNA and then you make into a protein whereas Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA vaccines. So you take that mRNA, make this by protein and go on and raise an immune response. And Novavax, which is probably gonna be approved in India the earliest, um, is uh, giving the protein itself with an adjuvant. So all involving that, that protein, which is relevant when we talk about variants. So remember what the immune system does. It raises, it, it does two important things um, in response to the vaccine. It, if, if, if done right, I mean, if it works right, the vaccine should actually raise T cells, which go into your memory. And then um, what T cells do is that they fight viruses in a very durable way. And if they're in your memory, they can last a very long time. There's um, evidence from the SARS pandemic from uh, 2002, 2003, that um, people who survived that still have very strong T cell immunity 20 years, or 17 years later. Uh, we have evidence from measles vaccines that we have uh, got as a child that we have T cells 34 years later and counting. Um, and then, uh, and then the, the vaccines also raise B cells, which if we're lucky again, they should go into the, your memory bank. And then those memory banks of B cells, um, they make antibodies when you need them. So importantly, antibodies are gonna come down with time. That's actually totally normal. In fact, I had every antibody of every cold or vaccine I've ever had, I would really, our blood would be so thick we couldn't move. So antibodies are going to go down, but the memory B cells become the blueprint to make more antibodies if needed. And that is tremendously important when we think about the durability of the vaccines. There are now two studies that show us, actually several, but that shows us that to, after two mRNA vaccines, you get very um, strong B cell formation in your memory B cell formation in lymph nodes. Um, actually, they biopsy lymph nodes. Those, those are the germinal centers where B cells are formed. In immunocompromised, those B cells are not formed as strongly after two doses. But in immunocompetent individuals, very strong production of memory B cells. And we have plenty of evidence that the, the, the including from the phase one, two trials, that the vaccines generate strong um, memory B T cell immunity. T cells are actually what, what modulates our protection against severe disease. We knew this even before the vaccines that people who mounted a strong T cell response could have asymptomatic infection. And in fact, um, this is true of multiple diseases. T cells are really there to protect you from severe disease. And that will come up again when we talk about the clinical, the real world studies of the vaccines. Um, and this, it's not relevant to go over the details of these studies, but we know that of course the um, vaccines produce strong T cell immunity because in the phase one and two trials of the vaccines, they didn't just measure antibodies because that we are now in, in the year 2020. So we have the capability of measuring T cell immunity, which is um, actually very difficult to measure and wasn't, wasn't measured in a lot of other uh, trials uh, be before of older vaccines, but we have the technology now. So there was strong T cell immunity formed to all the vaccines in just when they were being initially um, tested in phase one, two trials. Um, and that was uh, for all three of the ones that we have in this country, along with antibodies. And in fact, the clinical trials were very consistent that they really had high protection against severe disease in the phase three clinical trials. That's the yellow column here. It's true of the whole inactivated variants as well. 
So will these vaccines work against the variants? And will, should they continue to have activity against severe disease? Well, if we just think about T cells, which are not actually separated from B cells either, but um, yes, that answer is yes. And what do I mean by that? So alpha, beta, gamma, delta, these different variants that uh, have been of such concern. Dr. Gandhi, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but the uh, interpreters are saying slower, slower. Even please. slower. Okay, sorry yes. about that. Okay. No worries. This for me is very slow. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I will keep on going for slow. Sorry about that. Um, so Delta, the Delta variant, of course, the, the dominant variant worldwide, um, has 11 mutations across its spike protein. So taking the original um, ancestral strain, there are 11 mutations across the spike protein that um, distinguish the, the Delta variant. And, uh, and the important thing about T cell immunity is that it, T cells line up across the spike protein in a very in-breath way. So for example, um, even from natural infection, we know that uh, to put it sort of simply, there are at least 87 to 100 T cells that line up across the spike protein. So if you have 11 mutations from Delta, you still have 75 at least T cells that are there to protect you. So um, the in-breath and robust response of of T cell immunity means it'll be very difficult to evade T cell immunity uh, from a, with a variant because by the time a variant would produce say a hundred or eighty seven um, uh, mutations across the spike protein, it's very unlikely to be able to work. So we're very confident that T cell immunity will re remain and does remain robust against the variants. And there are multiple studies that show that, including from UCSF and the Hoya Institute of um, Immunology. Uh, strong um, protection of your T cells that are generated by the vaccines against different variants. And it sort of speaks to this data, I'll skip ahead to this, which was presented at the FDA meeting um, when they were considering boosters, which really showed across a number of different settings, um, uh, UK, Canada, um, Israel as well, uh, US, uh, really strong protection against severe disease with the two dose mRNA vaccines um, uh, leading into, because this was data presented in September, um, the time of the Delta variant. So really strong, enduring protection, at least through this variant against severe disease. So, you know, what would mean, why are we seeing more symptomatic breakthroughs then? And what, what does that mean? What is the antibody response um, versus the T cell response? Um, and this really relates to the question of boosters. Well, vaccine effectiveness is not just T cell immunity and it's not just the vaccine. It has a lot to do with who you are as a host. So you would need to produce that strong B cell immunity to actually develop antibodies if you see the virus again. It also depends on how much circulating virus there is. When there is a lot of circulating virus, even with the polio vaccine, we saw breakthrough infections because when you don't see infections among the vaccinated is when you've tamped down transmission in the world usually um, to, to lower levels. And we have very high rates of transmission across this planet. Um, and then it also depends on the type of vaccine and how, how um, you give the vaccine. If you give it with a three week duration or four week duration or eight weeks between doses, 12 weeks between doses, it matters the duration of time that you have between doses, which is why the UK and Canada likely chose the right strategy of extending time between the doses of the Pfizer vaccine. So um, this is a good example of some US data that even into the Delta variant, still very high protection against hospitalizations. You're uh, 20, time, 20 times more like, 29 times more likely to be hospitalized um, in the Delta variant if you were unvaccinated than if you were vaccinated. And um, again, I do think that there's more symptomatic breakthroughs at this time, not just because of um, uh, the high viral load of the Delta variant, but I think that our antibodies will decrease. It's absolutely, again, natural, not a glitch. Um, it's what happens. Um, and also it's important to say that, that um, a Mayo Clinic study showed that um, there were fewer reinfections, even with mild infections with the Moderna vaccine, which is given four weeks apart and is also a higher dose than the Pfizer vaccine, which is given three weeks apart. And the Israeli data is um, exclusively with the Pfizer vaccine. Um, so 
So these waning antibodies, definitely you have a lot of antibody protection in your nose, the vaccines generate IgA, but they're gonna go down. And so you may be more likely at this point in time to get a mild symptomatic breakthrough. But really what, what do the B cells do? And what should happen if you have an immunocompetent system? If you have an immunocompetent system, and this is true of, of natural immunity, this is true of, of vaccine-induced immunity, this is what memory B cells do, that you get antibodies that go up with the original viral infection, they come down or with the vaccine. And then if you see the virus again, your, your memory B cells will produce high levels of antibodies again. And importantly, these antibodies, um, and there's several studies now that show this, there's actually three, um, are directed against the variants, meaning your memory B cells don't like hide antibodies in them, they produce them to what they see in front of them. So a variant um, in the future, they will actually, if they see a Delta variant, but you've got the original ancestral strain, they will adapt the, the antibodies they make. This is a Oregon science study, a UPenn study. There's a study from Johnson & Johnson against the variant that's they're seeing in front of them. Um, so who needs an additional booster? I definitely immunocompromised patients have always needed additional boosters. Um, they have always needed third sh or, or more shots than even a three, typical three-dose vaccine. I, as, a, as an HIV doctor, I give um, patients with hepatitis B um, more than three shots often. Uh, and so absolutely this is indicated. Um, but the going back to the global vaccine equity issue that you brought to the end, we are brought up at the end, we are less likely to ever get to a time that we don't have a high circulating virus if we don't think about the rest of the planet. So out of 6 billion doses administered, about 2.2% have been given to low income countries. The G7 commitment that President Biden made and the UN summit commitment that was made on September 22nd, both have not um, come true. Um, and we have about five doses for every American right now stored up. So, um, you know, we have plenty uh, and uh, know those, those commitments have not been kept. Uh, do vaccines reduce transmission? You actually have to think Do, about- Dr. Gandhi, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but five doses for every American versus how many doses for people outside the US um, in the developing world? Uh, so what I mean is we've stored up five doses for every American. We've only given two each if it's an mRNA vaccine, um, but we have enough that it, we actually, this isn't just through the US. All rich countries have, um, we call it hoarding. Uh, you know, have hoarded up about five vaccines for every one of their rich uh, um, people um, in rich countries. Um, as I said, only two per two point, and it's now up to 2.2, .2, but it's not that much better. 2.2% of the vaccines available in the world have been given out in low income part, uh, countries, 2.2%. It's, it's literally that inequitable. I mean, it's sort of mind blowing to me um, this far into the pandemic. It's mind blowing to the WHO as well. So in terms of dropping, you know, in terms of the concept of transmission, um, it's true that your that alpha before the Delta variant, there was really high uh, level of protection from getting any virus into your nose at all, even asymptomatic infection, because likely our, our IgA and IgG antibodies were very plump um, and, and available in the nose. There is There are T cell islands in the nose, but, um, antibodies are sort of first line of defense in the nose. And again, antibodies will decrease over time. Uh, but to say that um, our antibodies, or sorry, that, that the vaccinated is are le equally as likely to transmit as the unvaccinated is not very biological statement. And I think it was an accident, or I think it was mistaken messaging when the CDC said that in the end of July. And it was based on a very particular circumstance of an outbreak with a lot of intimacy, with a lot of um, closed windows, no masks, uh, mixed vaccinated and unvaccinated people in a province town outbreak, but actually other outbreaks of the Delta variant among the uh, vaccinated have not shown that same finding where the viral load, it, well, actually what that province town study showed is the viral load at one point in time is likely the same among a vaccinated symptomatic breakthrough in the nose at least by what's what's called a cycle threshold and a PCR test, which is um, you know not the best way to measure viral load. But um, but if you do serial viral loads, this is a Singapore study. The breakthroughs go down. Um, uh, sorry, the the viral load goes down more quickly among those who are vaccinated, which makes sense. Your antibodies are being produced by your B cells, and they're killing that virus in the nose. 
And then this is actually a study from the Netherlands with Delta breakthroughs among healthcare workers. And if you um, culture the virus, the uh, virus is more sick because it's, it, it was so is less infectious um, because you want to culture a virus to see if it's as likely to spread. And then finally, being asymptomatic and vaccinated, um, you have to look at case cluster sort of analyses. This is one from Singapore. There's one from Harvard. There's one from the University of Illinois. And now there's one from Pell Canada that it not very many people who are asymptomatic and vaccinated are spreading. Um, maybe possible, but it's very rare. And so again, those are the symptomatic breakthroughs when you don't feel well um, that you could be spreading. And then this is the CDC data as of just this morning. They always track the breakthrough infections, severe breakthrough infections in this country. And out of 183 million Americans who are fully vaccinated, there absolutely have been breakthroughs, severe breakthroughs with hospitalizations and very rarely deaths. Uh, 70, uh, and I mean really rarely actually, uh, luckily, 70% um, of the hospitalizations are over 65 year old individuals and 86% of the deaths of vac um, after vaccination um, from COVID-19. And there's about 4,000 out of 183 million Americans vaccinated, 86% uh, were above 65. So I think that, um, you know, uh, vaccinating and giving a third booster to those over 65, to those who are fully immuno, uh, who are immunocompromised and to selected groups, for example, those who are having frequent exposures. So a healthcare worker who is intubating patients with COVID, absolutely a respiratory therapist, because there's frequent exposure. And again, having a lot of virus around you, you're more likely to uh, get infected um, and even have a uh, breakthrough. But it is pretty amazing what a two dose vaccine does in terms of storage of memory B cells, storage of memory T cells. And so that's why I think the um, selected booster strategy makes sense. And I do have to end because it's important to come back to this. It, it, I think it's impossible to um, escape uh, the responsibilities of rich countries who who truly have the majority of the vaccine supply, um, that the only way to stop people from being exposed to virus is to tamp down transmission everywhere. And to keep everyone safe, if we just take away the ethical and moral obligation to vaccinate the world, if we completely remove that from the equation, which I don't know how we can, um, certainly uh, we are not safe from variants until other people are safe. So I'll end there and then, and then take your questions. So there are a number of questions for you, Dr. Gandhi, but I would like to ask this question first. You referenced a number of vaccines, um, the Novavax, Sputnik, um, et cetera. Are all vaccines equal? Um, we, are, we have vaccines in the developing world that are very different from the vaccines that we are getting. And can you, can you um, uh, talk a little bit about that? Um, Yes, um, so uh, the, it's a great question actually. Um, the Sinovac and the Sinovarm, um, at least when they were originally being rolled out in Chile and Brazil, for example, there were some data that they didn't seem to be as effective as um, at least in reducing transmission, which may be in the memory B cell and then the antibody response, though they were protective against severe disease. AstraZeneca is also very protective against severe disease. Again, maybe less effective with the um, transmission question. Covaxin, though we don't, we haven't seen a peer-reviewed uh, publication, this is the part of the pharmaceuticals one, is actually, at least what they put in their press release is very effective against um, severe disease and, and, AC, and symptomatic infection both. Um, but it would be great to see a uh, fully published paper on that. Sputnik V, at least with the alpha variant, was extremely effective. It was about 96%. This was the ancestral strain and alpha. I have not seen data with Sputnik V in the setting of Delta, though, though you know, it is a, it is a DNA vector like Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, so I would assume it would be around the same effectiveness. So there is differences um, of these, but I would say that 
certainly any vaccine is better than no vaccine when we're dealing with severe disease and death of healthcare workers, of vulnerable patients. Um, and then if we need to go back and boost someone who got a Sinovac or a Sinopharm later, then we can do so. But any vaccine that the country has, I would definitely administer. And that, that was a concern sometimes at the beginning with the AstraZeneca vaccine, that it was, it was being, there was places that had it that, that didn't administer it. Dr. Newman, could you please respond to Dr. Gandhi's um, presentation? So you both have very different points of view. Dr. Gandhi, I don't know if you got a chance to hear Dr. Newman's uh, presentation. I had a, there's someone who won't vaccinate, not, uh, vaccinate. so um, I'm, I'm concerned about the unvaccinated won't get the first or second dose. So that's why I was a little late, but I heard some of it and thank you. And I yes. think, that, you know, there's no right answer to anything. Right, so Dr. Newman? Uh, sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, some of the points. Um, uh, and yeah, thank you for making that actually, Dr. Gandhi. And I, I like what you do. Yeah. <laughs> thank <right>. you. <laughs> um, so I hear a lot about culturing virus as a good measure of whether or not a virus is going to be dangerous or as a way to do it. It's very complicated, though, because when you are culturing a virus, you are generally taking a virus that is stuck in mucus or has been floating in an enzyme bath that we call saliva, which is also less salty than the virus would like it to be, and so puts a thing called hypotonic stress on it. So it's really not surprising to me that it is difficult to recover some viruses in this way, but the most recoverable virus would probably be whatever is coming directly out of a cell into respiratory droplets. And that is the hardest to measure. So that would be the caution uh, there. Uh, in terms of the animal reservoirs for COVID, this is another point where I would take a different view in that I think to be really unsolvable a virus would have to be persistently infecting some hosts. So we know that it can infect mink and cats, but they both clear the virus reliably within a week. We know that dogs get the virus for less time than cats. And we know that some white-tailed deer develop antibodies to the virus, but we don't know how much virus they have. And it's hard to catch a deer to actually ask them, I think. So I don't know that we actually meet the criterion for an animal reservoir, which I would agree would potentially change the long-term prognosis uh, here. In terms of the memory T and B cells, with influenza virus, we see that people build up large amounts of these, but sometimes they become what's called tissue resident. They go to places where it becomes difficult to reactivate them. And this is why we have to revaccinate to get a current crop that are out in circulation and kind of paying attention. We don't know that this is the case for COVID. And so far, the data that we have doesn't suggest that it will be. But that's my concern at the back of my mind that we don't fall into sort of a trap of thinking that we're protected when we may not be, yeah. Um, and lastly, I would say the only way to prevent the virus from changing is to prevent infection. And if we use death as our main means of effectiveness for the vaccines, I think we will allow enough viral change that this may become a bigger problem and to analogize, I think it would be like playing chess and considering that any move that didn't result in death of the king would be an okay move. And <laughs> I don't think that makes much sense either. Yeah. So the data I think that everyone's looking at are roughly the same. And what we're talking about here are differences in what we should do with the data or how we should feel about the data. And I think thinking people can disagree on these things. 
Thank you. Um, so um, Julia uh, Dudley Najib at the start of the briefing had a question about getting that third shot for herself and for her parents. Julia, could you ask your question of both uh, uh, Dr. Sure. Newman and Dr. Gandhi? Sure, uh, no problem. Uh, Julia Dudley Najib, uh, Ami News, located in the Central Valley. And I really depend on Dr. Gandhi and Dr. Newman because I literally, we broadcast this everywhere because that's what's helped us to get the information out. So thank you again for uh, both of you being dedicated uh, to ethnic media, making sure we get the most detailed information. And so the questions I've been asked about is natural immunity. Uh, and these are from individuals who were fully vaccinated, but still ended up getting the COVID-19 virus. They were not hospitalized, but um, they were. So there's some confusion in our community about, well, do I have natural immunity and why doesn't that count? even after I've been fully vaccinated. And also now, I why are they telling me that I might need to, to get a booster shot if I ended up getting the COVID-19 virus? And so I, I didn't have an explanation for that. So looking forward to um, either of you answering it. Thank you. If both of you could answer that, that would be terrific. Do you wanna go first or <laughs> should I? Yeah. Dr. Gandhi? Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I mean, vaccine effectiveness, um, that slide that I showed, it's not 100%. You can still get symptomatic infection after um, vaccination. And I think that what we've been pretty lucky about is when I showed you the CDC data about severe breakthroughs, they really were very rare. Um, and both in terms of hospitalizations and deaths uh, and um, were between 80 to 87% 80 to in those over 65. So um, in the order of 0.002%. So getting a mild symptomatic breakthrough, I mean, this is, um, you know, there has been interpretations of the data to say, and I know this is a global audience, but um, we want to prevent uh, Americans from getting a cold, um, but we, uh, uh, let vulnerable and healthcare workers die in the rest of the world. So I, 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 I'm having a real, I have a really hard time distinguishing the booster discussion from the, the um, global vaccine equity discussion. I think, it's, I think it is truly impossible to separate it. And um, so yes, you absolutely, your, your antibodies will decrease in your nose and you can absolutely get a symptomatic breakthrough. I think from data from Utah, Virginia, and Washington State, it all depends again on how much circulating virus to get a symptomatic breakthrough. It was one in 5,000 at the height of places in like Virginia and Utah. And then in Washington, it was about one in 10,000. And now as we've had decreasing cases across the country, and we have the lowest rates of transmission in California, it's harder to see the virus to even get a mild symptomatic breakthrough. Dr. Newman, do you want to take that question on? Sure. And my perspective, unfortunately, comes from Texas. And my goodness, yeah, <laughs> our problems <laughs> here are somewhat different. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would say that the available research does not suggest that one dose of COVID is any better for you in terms of your immune system than two doses of a vaccine. Um, generally, it looks like similar levels of protection, but these are both a somewhat leaky protection. The virus will sometimes get through. And what is clear from the data is that boosting either after an infection or after a vaccination leads to much higher levels of immunity, both in terms of pieces of the immune system you can measure and in terms of effectiveness at least over the few months where this has been tested. And um, just, I think a point that has not come up yet is that currently only people that took the Pfizer vaccine initially are now eligible to get that uh, third shot. Uh, is, that, is that correct, uh, Dr. Gandhi and Dr. Newman? And when do you expect um, uh, people that took Moderna uh, the, or the J and J to also be eligible. I can say from the scientific point of view, I don't think there's any difference in the quality or material difference in the quantity of immunity 
from these or in the relative benefits of a booster after any of those uh, vaccines. I would expect them to be similar, but we're talking about regulations and regulatory processes, and those can be a little more labyrinthine. You're right. It's only been approved for selected individuals for Pfizer, and then the FDA has applied for a 50 microgram dose as a booster. Sorry, Moderna has, and the FDA said they would know by the end of this month. They would um, give a signal on that, and then the Johnson & Johnson, I think there's quite a bit of data that it would need a second dose. Um, both from hospitalization data released by the CDC, and um, and by the company's data on the two dope, on a booster, well, a second dose, and so I'm hoping at least by the end of October we'll get um, recommendations for Moderna and Johnson and Johnson. Terrific. Rosanna has an interesting question. Rosanna. Yes. Hello, Hi, Rosan. Hello, I'm here. Hi, Doc. Please share more about the FDA links uh, to authorization on the uh, Moderna booster at half dose. What that means? And how about a Pfizer? Why and what are uh, the ingredients within the booster um, compared? was the uh, vaccine. I'm not sure we got that. I think the question was about, is the Pfizer the same dose maybe? And it is the 30 microgram, the booster is the 30 microgram. The Moderna, the original dose was 100 and they're asking for the booster to be 50. I think the Pfizer dose in children was uh, 10. Is that right? Uh, whereas the, the adult- Five to 11, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We to Marwa has a question and then we'll go to Sandy for the big picture question. Ooh. Ritu. Are you still with us? Can you read her question? Um, I cannot find it in the chat, but I do have a question for Dr. Gandhi before we move to you, Sandy, if I um, could ask that question. The CDC, uh, Dr. Gandhi, um, last week rolled out a tiered approach where it uh, suggested that high risk workers be prioritized. Um, who would you prioritize in a tiered approach? Would you also prioritize um, parents who live with unvaccinated children? That's a great question. Um, I would prioritize, uh, we are prioritizing healthcare workers who have a lot of exposure. So um, a healthcare worker who's, um, you know, not around COVID patients wouldn't, is not being, I don't think need it right now by their criterion. Um, and then, but parents who live with immunocompromised children uh, definitely, I think, should get a third shot because, again, you just don't even want a trans uh, transmission potential to someone who is who could get sick um, and can't get vaccinated yet. But all unvaccinated children, uh, uh, I don't think that's. I mean, again, that's not at least what they recommended, and I I agreed with their approach. Interesting. Ritu's question is, what do you think of Merck's experimental pill to treat COVID-19 cuts risk of hospitalization and death in half? Um, the pharmaceutical company reports according to the Washington Post. I'm excited about it. <laughs> I don't know if you looked into it, Dr. Duba, but it's, 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 it's an antiviral, it's a nucleoside analog. It actually works against lots of different polymerases of different viruses, but then it got repurposed to try it here for SARS-CoV-2 and at least in 775 participants of a 1500 person trial, they closed it early because um, it looked like it reduced the risk of proceeding to hospitalization if you had mild to moderate COVID in half. So from 15% to 7.3%. So it's, I think it's, and there was also reduction in death. So I think it's very exciting to have the idea of an outpatient antiviral 
uh, where monoclonal antibodies are there, but they're, they're harder. IV or sub-Q, they're harder to use. This is like a pill. It's, it would be exciting. Likely we'll get resistance to it later, but, but we can get down. If we can get everyone vaccinated, maybe we won't need to use this so much. <laughs> Terrific. Sandy, yeah. to you for the... Oh, I'm so sorry, oh, yeah. Dr. Newman. Real yes. fast. Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Totally agree. Uh, and I think it is promising. Molnupiravir, which is the drug we're talking about, I would look at that more as um, like a fire extinguisher, and I'm more interested in fire prevention, uh, I would say. <laughs> but I think it is a very useful tool to have. And I think if it works as well as it did in the small study, in a larger study, this is going to save lives. That's great. Sandy, please close it out with your final question for well, both speakers. I see that Pilar has asked a question that's very California-centric, but maybe is perhaps a very relevant question for those of us in California. Pilar asks, the governor of California just announced mandatory vaccines in schools, quote, following the FDA, full FDA approval. Do you agree with this approach? We'll ask Texas first and then we'll end up with California. I don't know that Texas should be allowed to comment on California. But, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I would say I am in favor of um, yeah, uh, school age vaccination anywhere, simply from the perspective of shrinking the potential reservoir for circulating COVID as much as possible. Uh, right now, 14.6% of the US is under the age of 12. And that is a big chunk of the herd if we're ever gonna to move toward herd immunity. Fantastic. And I, I agree, I agree. Well, you, you both, uh, you've both given us much more than we asked for. We asked for what do we do, boost or not? <laughs> and you've given us a marvelous seminar on a much more complicated uh, set of issues and questions. We're extremely grateful to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you next week.